Wherever you work, whatever you do for a job, there will be hazards which could harm your health, safety and well-being if uncontrolled. Some hazards are obvious. We know that the knife is sharp, we know that if we walk near a big drop it's dangerous and we know that if we get hit by a fork truck it will hurt. However, some hazards are not so obvious. As humans, we're pretty good at identifying hazards and avoiding them. However, there are many, many things that we simply can't detect with our naked caveman eyeballs. Things like radiation, diseases and asbestos simply can't be seen, heard, smelled or felt. And generally, we only realise that we've been exposed when the negative effects kick in. However, these hazards can cause injury just as debilitating as fatal as a knife, a fall or being struck by an item of plant. So in order to keep everyone safe at work, we can't just identify the obvious hazards, we have to identify all the hazards that we encounter at work and how they can cause harm so appropriate measures can be put in place. And in order to identify all of these hazards, we need to take a structured approach. But before we start on our hazard identification journey, we need to do a bit of housekeeping. First off, we need a clear definition of what a hazard is. A hazard is anything that has the potential to cause damage to people, plant or property. Basically, anything that has the potential to cause an accident or ill health. This is in contrast to risk, which is the combination of likelihood of the hazard causing a negative effect and the severity of an accident if the hazard was to cause the negative effect. We'll be talking about risk in the next video, so subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss that. The word hazard and risk are used a bit interchangeably in everyday life, but when we are doing a risk assessment, it's important to make the distinction between the two words. The second, much more important piece of housekeeping is the fact you can't identify hazards from your office. You need to go to the area where the work will be done and you need to speak to the people who are going to be involved in the task. The people doing the work will have a much better idea of what hazards are associated with the task and will also know in detail how they envision the task will be completed. So their input is essential. Okay, so you're at the point of work with the people who are going to be carrying out the job. Now we need to take a systematic approach to identifying the hazards and to do this we firstly have to identify all the factors involved in the task that have hazards associated with them. These factors can be broken down into four categories. People and process. These are the people who are going to be involved or may be affected by the task you are planning to undertake. Within your list of people, you will have the person carrying out the work. However, there will also be other people who may be affected. These could be other workers in the area, contractors, visitors to site or members of the public, or even trespassers who shouldn't really be there. Also, think about the process the people will be working to and how the task will be carried out. Equipment. Next, think about what equipment will be required for the task. Most tasks require quite a bit of equipment in order to complete the task. Even the task as mundane as boiling an egg requires a pan, a hob, some sort of egg retrieval tool and a timer. Each piece of equipment will have its own set of risks, so it's important that we identify all of the equipment required for the task. Next up, what materials are you using for the task? Most tasks require materials which will transform into the finished product or be required to provide your service. Whether you're a builder with bricks and mortar or a cleaner with an army of cleaning fluids, materials will be required to do your job. Just like equipment, each type of material you use will have a selection of hazards associated with it. So listing the materials involved will assist you later in identifying all the hazards associated with them. Finally, look at the environment where the task is going to be carried out. Will it be carried out indoors or outdoors? On a busy high street or in a quiet office? High up or underground? By defining where the work will be conducted, we will identify hazards at the next stage associated with the environment of the task, as well as environmental factors that may exaggerate the risk profile of hazards derived from tools, equipment, materials, or people. By grouping elements of the task into people and processes, equipment, materials, and environmental categories, it will help you identify hazards associated with each part of the process. You can remember the categories through the acronym 
pee me. Now, each of the items that you have listed going through these categories are not hazards on their own, but they will likely have hazards associated with them, which could cause you harm. And as mentioned earlier, some of these will be obvious and some will be hazards that are harder to spot. For example, if you have identified that one of the pieces of equipment you will need is a circular saw, there are the obvious hazards of cutting yourself on the blade. However, there will also be a range of other hazards such as noise, vibration and dust associated with that tool too. So for each item that we have listed from going through the PME, we need a systematic approach to identifying all the hazards and so we need to look at six categorizations of hazards. These are physical, biological, chemical, environmental, organizational and mechanical. And you can remember this through the acronym PERBRICATION. I can do better than that. BOMPEC? No. KEMBOM. Ugh, close enough. So, let's take a look at each of these categories individually. Chemical. Many processes at work use chemicals and harmful substances. Machines and plant have oils, lubricants and fuels required to run them. If you're building a structure, you will be using cements, adhesive, sealants, paints. Even general office work requires chemicals for cleaning, printer inks, etc. as part of the normal duties. Many chemicals in the workplace are harmful to health and can cause nasty burns, irritation and even conditions such as asthma. In addition, there are also safety hazards such as increased risk of fire and explosions. So step one. Take a look at the process and see what hazardous substances are going to be required and make a list. Environmental. These are the hazards associated with where the work is going to take place. So if you're working outside, the weather presents a range of hazards. In cold weather, you have hazards such as frostbite and the increased risk of slips and trips. Whereas in hot weather, you will have hazards such as heat stroke and sunburn. Similarly, high winds can present hazards when working at high and with vehicle movements. Heavy rain can reduce visibility and lead to sludgy ground, which can cause slip and trip hazards. Depending on where you are working and whatever time of year you are doing the task, weather hazards will be different. So bear in mind this when you are doing your assessment. Not all work takes place outside, so weather is not always an issue. However, environmental hazards can also come into play in an indoor working environment. Environmental hazards such as noise, lighting and the temperature of the environment can also prevent hazards which need to be controlled too. Mechanical. These are hazards that are caused by the operation of a machine or tool, such as contact with moving parts. Generally, machines don't stop for people. If you get hit by a tractor, it is going to do far more damage to you than you are to it. The same applies for tools. If you try and stop a drill spinning at 2000 RPM with your bare hand, it isn't going to end too well, is it? Similarly, it won't be stopped by your hair or clothes either and will start to draw you into the machine instead, which sounds like a horrendous way to get injured. Mechanical hazards also includes things being ejected from the machine. Swarf ejects from a drill or sparks from a grinding disc can result in a range of stabbing and puncture wounds. When we get to the risk evaluation video, you will see that mechanical hazards are generally at the, at the higher end of the risk scale. So definitely don't miss these particularly if you're looking at hazards associated with the equipment you're using. Biological. This includes any nasty bacteria, viruses or other pathogens that you might be exposed to during the task. You will likely find these when you are looking at tasks that involve cleaning, handling a waste, working with poorly people or working with animals. Within this category, I would also think about things like animal bites. So if you're in a profession that works with animals such as vets, a postman or an employer eye safe with four dogs running around a small office, then look at these hazard categories very carefully. Organisational. Next up are the organisational hazards. These are the hazards which arise from the way we run our businesses and particularly the way people behave as a result of our management decisions. Time pressures, shift durations and overtime are a big issue here as they can lead to people cutting corners and making mistakes. Similarly, ineffective supervision can lead to the same corner cutting and mistakes being made. 
The relationships with other people is also an organisational hazard. Internally, we can have hazards such as bullying, inequality in our workloads. Externally, we can see hazards such as violence and abuse, particularly when dealing with members of the public. Ultimately, it is the organisational hazards that are the primary cause of mental health issues such as stress and depression which are becoming more significant and more prevalent in the health and safety statistics, particularly when it comes to absence rates. So look at these carefully and be critical of your own organisation when trying to identify hazards in this category. Physical. Finally, we have the physical hazards and it's time to pull out our GCSE physics textbooks now because many of the things we studied in physics can cause us harm in the workplace. Gravity leads to trips, falls from high and falling objects which can land on people. Newton clearly didn't do his hazard identification when the apple hit him, did he? Adding lack of friction to gravity and you get a slip hazard. Many of the ergonomic risk factors such as force and lighting come under the category of physical hazards too. So consider hazards such as manual handling and the use of display screen equipment in this category. Also consider things like vibration and noise produced from your actions that people may be exposed to during the task. Radiation isn't present in every workplace, however some machines, particularly ones used for imaging, use radiation. But radiation is one of the three methods in which fire can spread, along with conduction and convection. So consider your fire hazards in with this category too. And speaking of conduction, consider your electrical hazards here too. If we look at these six categories for each aspect we are identified in the PME stage, then we stand a good chance of identifying all the hazards involved in a task and how they can harm us. From here, we can move on to our evaluation of risk, which we'll cover in our next video. So make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications to catch that. But to hammer the process home, let's do an example and try to identify all the hazards associated with a task. Let's say we're working at the car wash washing cars. Car nope, we already did that with button bop, stop it. Let's start with looking at PME. So the process is a car drives in, it's blasted with a pressure washer to get the thick of the dirt off, cleaning fluids are applied to the car using a sponge, then we blast it off with a pressure washer again, and the car goes to be waxed and polished. We then take payment and the car drives away. The people involved are going to be you, your colleagues, the people who are having their car washed, members of the public in general, including, in this case, there may be young, pregnant or vulnerable people. The equipment that is going to be used is your pressure washer and assortment of brushes, sponges, cloths. The materials are going to be cleaning products and waxes, etc. And the environment is going to be outside and there is going to be a significant amount of vehicle movement. So within this, we've got quite a lot of things that we need to look at the hazards for. However, to avoid this video becoming three hours long, I'm just going to pick one, the use of a pressure washer. So let's look at Ken Bob. Stop, just stop. Chemicals. At some point in the process, we're going to have to blast off the cleaning products using the pressure washer. So there are hazards in the form of the chemicals getting onto our skin, into our eyes, as well as inhaling and ingesting the substance through splashback and water mist. Exposure, particularly long-term exposure to chemicals you would see in this activity could lead to a range of illnesses and skin conditions. So this is definitely a hazard we need to control. Environmental. We're going to be using the pressure washer outside in all weathers and the fact that the pressure washer sprays water is going to be a hazard here as the chances are whoever is going to be using the pressure washer is going to get wet. If the weather is minus two and you're spending the day in wet clothes, this can produce hazards such as hyperthermia and poor circulation to your extremities. Add in hazards like vibration, which we'll talk about in a moment, and you're increasing the risk of conditions such as vibration, white finger. 
In addition, you are going to be using the item of electrical equipment in wet conditions. Now, a pressure washer is going to be IP rated, so water will not interact with the electricity within the equipment. However, the extension cable, which may be used to power the pressure washer, may not be IP rated, and that needs to be considered with as electrical hazards. Mechanical. Hopefully the cars have stopped when you do it in this job, otherwise you have some major mechanical hazards here. However, the pressure washer itself has mechanical hazards too. The equipment will have pumps with moving parts, which if unguarded, may cause a mechanical hazard. Now, hopefully all the casing is intact and the moving parts are properly guarded. However, we will need to check this is the case prior to use. The main mechanical hazard, however, is the fact that we are ejecting high pressure water. Have you ever accidentally caught a part of your body when using a pressure washer? Spoiler alert, it bloody hurts. Therefore, we have a hazard of making contact with the water the pressure washer is in use. Not just for the person using it, but also for other people in the area. Biological. This is similar to our chemical hazard. Again, we're blasting dirty cars with high pressure water and there'll likely be an element of splashback. The dirt on the cars could harbour a number of nasty pathogens from the road dirt, animal poo, particularly pigeon poo, dead insects, etc. When we're blasting this off the car, it could splash back and get on our skin, in our eyes, in our mouth, and the dirt contained in the atomised water could be inhaled. Exposure to these can make whoever is in the area, particularly the user of the pressure washer, ill. Organisational. The pressure washer is a key part of the process and is required at two critical steps in the car washing process. This means that if a person uses the washer is slow, it holds up other workers. This introduces time pressures on the user, particularly if other staff members are waiting around or other customers are in the queue waiting around pipping their horns. This could lead to the operator to rush and cut corners, which can lead to the operator error as well as stress. Finally, we've got the physical hazards. We've touched on a couple of areas such as vibration and electricity, however we also have noise levels and ergonomic issues too. So we've identified the hazards associated with the use of the pressure washer and I'm pretty confident we've identified all the hazards here. Now we need to repeat the process for all the other elements of the task identified in our PME. At this point you may be thinking this seems like a long-winded approach and to be blunt, it does take time to identify all the hazards associated with the task. But be honest, would you have identified all the hazards associated with the task of using a pressure washer without following the process? I'm looking at you, biological hazards. If you think you would have, feel free to argue with me in the comments below. Hopefully you will see the benefit of effective hazard identification, however we still have a lot more to do to build an effective risk assessment and next up we need to evaluate the risk of each hazard. So make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications to catch that. So this has been a behemoth of a video and let's be honest it isn't the most fascinating topic so if you've reached this point well done and thank you for watching. But until next time, stay safe out there.